Mary and Bridget are buds. Kind of feels weird to say it that way, but I don't really know a better way to say it. Friends just doesn't quite have the same resonance. Doesn't really capture the relationship between these two spirits. This great mother of God and the Christian faith and this great mother goddess of the Irish pantheon. This goddess of the forge, goddess of justice, of healing, of inspiration. Words that actually apply to both of these women. In fact, their relationship is so tight and their devotion is so intimately intertwined. Bridget is often referred to as the Mary of the Gales. Well, as we're approaching the third quarter moon and contemplating the Via Positiva, this interesting time that we're living, let's talk about how Mary and Bridget together can be powerful guides, helping us to find hope and peace moving towards the new year as we walk together down Creation's Atlas. Hello everyone, my name is Charlie. I am a Christopagan Druid and Beast of Bridget. Hello everyone, my name is Brian. I am a Christopagan Druid and sous chef to the Dunker. Today we're going to be talking about well, two people that I have so much devotion to that you would not be surprised if you come to my house because they're everywhere. Any good way. I have a lot of icons and pictures and statues and whatnot because that's the kind of person that I am. And I do feel like, while we talk about them a lot separately, there's an interesting synergy between the two of them that often goes unremarked. So before we talk about that, if you haven't already, don't forget to like, subscribe, follow, whatever the terminology is on the app you're we will sing to us all. We do original Christo Pagan and Druid content on this channel five days a week, Monday through Friday. And you don't want to miss a thing, especially with Advent coming up, because, oh, we've got some things to talk about there. Alrighty, now let's get into it. the story I always want to start with because it's the one that I notice people struggle with most. And we've talked about this on the podcast in the past, but it's the idea that Bridget was not only the midwife who helped bring the Christ child into the world, but was there with Mary while she was giving birth. She's also the foster mother of Christ who helped basically take care of the child as Jesus was growing up. I love watching people's reactions to this idea because you can see who is trapped in historical thinking and who is able to kind of open up to more metaphorical, mystical, mythological thinking. Because, yeah, it's a weird idea that there'd be an Irish lady in Judea in the first century doing all this. But we're not talking history. We're talking Oh, Lord, I'm going to do the, I'm doing the rhyme. Oh, I'm just going to do it. We're not talking history. We're talking mystery. Yeah, I, I've, I've become that person. Wow. Oh, it's all myself. I wouldn't be, but here we are. Mysteries are meant to give you something to contemplate on. They're meant to have almost a grain of to a boulder of contradiction in the middle of them. So that you have to get out of your regular mode of thinking to get to the answer of, well, what does this mean? One, I, I think is fairly easy to, to grasp. It's the universality of both of these figures. Because one of the things I've noticed about Bridget devotion is she's everywhere. And I think it's kind of odd that Bridget is everywhere, to be quite honest. And I say this as a, not only a devotee, but somebody who took priesthood vows to Bridget and who works for her. I, I do find it odd that Bridget is the Irish goddess who is as ubiquitous as she is. Like, I could understand the more, because who doesn't like mystery, right? Who doesn't like prophecy and divination and all the powers that are associated with her? I could understand the more in being popular. I could kind of understand, you know, I know being popular because solar goddess, they seem to be fairly popular amongst people. Bridget is a full-on contradiction. She's goddess of the forge. She's the goddess of healing. She's the goddess of poetry. She's the goddess of fire and water. She's the goddess of judgment. She's the goddess who keened for the first time, who cried so hard she wailed over the death of her son. She is such a complex goddess that I find it interesting that people have gravitated to her so strongly. Usually when a, a goddess gets 
extremely popular, it's because they're fairly simple to understand. They're the goddess of a domain, a thing. Well, a lot of people may be into that one thing. And so that kind of accounts for that ubiquity, the, the popularity everywhere. Bridget is different. The prevalence of fire and water imagery alone, I think sets her apart and is what I think might connect her most with the person of Mary. Because one of the most common images that I know I encounter in my meditation when dealing with Bridget is this image of kind of a flame on top of a pool. We used to have an electric candle that would shine light up through water and it looked like a candle flame coming out of a fountain. It was beautiful. I love it. I can't find another one. It broke. But I used to keep it lit for Bridget because fire and water, it, it, it just, it got the message across. Mary has a similar, but very different fire and water image where she is very commonly called the star of the sea. It's probably because of an, a Latin pun. Star of the sea in Latin is Mari Stella, which sounds like Mary star. That's probably where that originated, but it has turned her into a patron saint, not only of sailors, but as a prominent guide to a lot of people. When you're setting out into the unknown, Mary is the one to guide you. And the star on wa over water and this flame in the sacred well. I don't know, when, when I think of these two together, those two images kind of play back and forth in my mind in a way that I don't have that same resonance with other spirits. I find it quite enjoyable due to the fact that it, it reminds me that life is messy. We so often focus our attention on one aspect and forget the rest of it. It, it phases out of existence to the individual through that focus. And it, real life is that messiness. It is that middle way, that balance, for instance, between the fire and water. For Bridget, being goddess of the forge, when people are talking about the forge, they're thinking of that giant pit of fire that the metal is shoved into. And then sometimes they talk about the hammering also, the sounds, that, that ting, ting, ting. They forget that that's part of the process. The other part is when you're tempering the metal, when you put it into the water. It is not finished until after that. It's true. It is useless until it is introduced into the water. I really love that about that imagery. I think one of the strangest and saddest connections between these two is that they both lost their children. According to the stories, all of Mary's kids were eventually martyred, starting with Jesus, the most famous Jesus being martyred, but most of her children ended up following him into the ministry. And the book of Acts records the martyrdom of James. And we can go down the line through most of her children's martyrdom. In fact, if we just take the stories on face value, all of her children died in her lifetime. And the same is true of Bridget. All of her children died for one reason or another, sometimes hubris, sometimes a misunderstanding, but all of her children died as well. And I think that's one of the things that makes them such strong beacons of hope because surviving and living through what is in so many ways the ultimate tragedy of you brought this life into this world only to watch it get snuffed out. Being able to survive that and make it to the other side of that feels unimaginable. I am I would say to most, but I'm just going to say to me. I, I can't imagine witnessing the loss of my own child, right? That's that's not how generations are supposed to work. Your children are supposed to outlive you. It, it makes you no know, sense. And the fact that they have this in common, in some ways, I think, makes them oddly relatable because they didn't live these perfect lives. When we talk about a lot of saints or spirits, yeah, especially with the saints, there's a lot of martyrdom involved, like the end of their lives are kind of rough, but the majority of their lives isn't entirely relatable, right? They either live in divine splendor, like a lot of the gods and goddesses are reported to do, or they're just so detached from reality that we don't even have a concept of them having a life. They, they don't seem to live between the stories. Bridget and Mary are rooted in our life. The stories we have of Mary are her as a refugee, her as a potential stable mother, afraid of being cast out by her husband. And we see this kind of worry 
in her relationship. We see her struggles throughout trying to organize the wedding at Cana, which was probably either Jesus's own marriage or the marriage of one of Jesus's brothers. Because for her to be in charge of the food at, at the wedding, it was, it was somebody in the family sweating. These are very relatable experiences and kind of the most heightened human experiences. For Bridget, we see Br Bridget through the Fomorian in in invasions. We see her under the occupation. We see her in the war for independence and the breaking free from that oppression that adds a flavor to her story that and i mean no disrespect to any hellenists or anyone who's listening but that i don't get from the greek gods like they have their time of strife too with the war against chronos and all of that but that that's kind of a zeus story that's not really all of them that's just kind of zeus fought them truly a lot of that is portrayed or at least pitched to the general public as more just sibling squabbles, petty bickering. It definitely feels like some kind of East Shore drama <laughs> sitcom than more like real life struggles. I mean, yes, there there are people have siblings and they have real life struggles and petty dramas with their siblings. That does happen. And we see that with Often. Bridget. We see but, the her yeah. relationship with her brothers, with her father. Yeah. Her very loving and sometimes distant relationship with her father there's a personable aspect in some ways you could kind of say that they were both mothers of the children of light with jesus quite literally you have that gospel of john in the beginning was the word and the word was with god and the word was life and the life was the light of all humankind bridget is the mother of the three gods wisdom and they also die back they don't have a good end to their story and it's depending on the version of the story generally through hubris or through terrible misunderstanding that causes them all to pass. But I think it's the relatability of these two that we really do connect to. And especially in times like this, in times like these, where there's a lot of fear and concern and worry, they are survivors. And that's something that you can't say of a lot of guides, especially when we're dealing with saints. I don't mean to sound like I'm knocking the saints, but let's be honest, most of the recognized saints that we talk about were martyrs. Like they quite literally did not survive what was going on. Mary, as the story goes, lived her entire life and was saved from death by her son. That the last thing that happens to Mary is she falls asleep and then is assumed bodily into heaven. Like she, she survives. She makes the list with Enoch and Elijah of the three who never tasted death. Like she just get, has a get out of death free card and she is in that way, kind of the ultimate survivor, right? She survived the occupation of Rome. She survived the being a refugee from Herod. She survived the persecution of her son's followers. She, she survives. We get a some similar kind of story with Bridget as well, a, a sort of strength that we can take from both of them. But main takeaway that I have about them is just when I see the Irish and Scottish devotion to these two, where you so often don't see one name without the other. So many prayers start with Mary ever virgin, Bridget ever bright, or some version of this where we're invoking both of them. We invoke them together. They are so traditionally connected and woven together. And it's because they are so similar, but different. Mary is a very loving mother. She's a very accepting mother figure. She is one who is there to take us in and to care for us. Whereas Bridget is very instructive. She's there to help, to guide, but not to coddle. You know, Mary will kind of hold you while you're crying and Bridget will try to help you work through whatever made you cry so that it doesn't happen again or you're at least more prepared for it should it happen again. And they're both kinds of love, acceptance, and strength that we need. I like that juxtaposition of grace and tempering because in our lives it's something that we often need especially when we're going through a tough time or as we like to say with this time of year as we're entering into the as the days are getting darker the nights are getting longer we're entering into dark and difficult times where we're concerned about that some of us need that grace we need that just acceptance and understanding patience and quiet to get through it and some of us need that tempering 
We need that firm hand to kind of shape and mold and toughen us up so that we're rebuilt and ready for the next go. And to approach this from a kind of Kabbalistic point of view, Mary very much is that embodiment of Kese, that loving kindness, that loving devotion, that unconditional, like, I am here for you, I am here to help. And Bridget is Gavura in so many ways. Strength, she's justice, she's judgment. She is just power. These two connect at Tefarat, at beauty. This is, I think, where our instinct for a triple goddess often comes in. It's like, well, you have Mary and Bridget. Who's the third goddess there? And the answer is, you're the third. You, you finished this little triptych. Yeah. You are the product. Oh. Yes, yes, you are the product. You are beauty. Yeah. You, you are that balance between the case of the loving kindness of Mary and the gavura, the strength of Frigid, that makes you the beautiful beacon of hope and strength and loving kindness and that balance between the two. And when you start really feeling that and living in that, it is empowering. It's also... I guess the only word I can use here is revelatory in how we are moving up the tree. As we are ascending up that tree, these two, which we could really put on at any points on the pillars, right? Mary is very much that wisdom of Fofwa, that understanding of Bina, is Bridget. The, you can see how, and then you are the knowledge, you are the Da'at between them, or the Keter, the crown that's being raised up which would between them whichever side of the line you're on you can see how that balance works because they do really embody those two pillars that pillar of severity or strength and that pillar of mildness or gentleness like they really do have these qualities together and they form the twin pillars at this at the entry to the temple which is why i feel like they are so often invoked together. When you look at the strengths of these women and Bridget's just grace, it comes from this place of strength. Like one of the stories of St. Bridget when she was a child. And the, the question is, because we don't have a lot of preserved stories about the goddess Bridget. So there's always this question of how many of these are Christianized versions of the goddess Bridget story and how many of them may be about a historical Bridget or how many of them are original stories like we, we weeding that out is really hard but in the story of uh saint bridget anybody who came to the house like any traveler moving by she's like oh do you need anything and she would go and get them milk and cheese and her father was constantly getting after her like what are you doing we we're gonna need that for the for the winter and no matter how much she gave away the lotter was always full there is that strength of no, I, I can do this. We can help each other. This is point of strength that she's going to be out there defending the livestock from the animals that mean them harm and from raids that would be trying to steal them from you, that she is out there protecting them from disease. Like she is this strong protector and she's always acting from this place of strength. And I think now more than ever in a lot of ways, we need both the energies of Bridget and Mary in our lives. We need that calm strength to know, you know, we got this. We, we can get through this. This isn't the worst thing that can happen because it is survival. We can get through to the other side. And we also need that gentle grace of Mary to help us to realize that we can do as she did. One of my favorite things about her is in the Gospel of Luke, everything that is said to Mary it's followed by this phrase, and she pondered their words in her heart. This very meditative, like, I'm not going to react. And remember, the two times we see this in Scripture for most she, prominently is when she meets two prophets, which she's taking the baby Jesus in, and they're like, oh, did you know? One of those is the prophecy that her own heart would be pierced because of this child. And instead of reacting, instead of saying anything, it simply says she pondered their words in her heart. And this, this grace, I mean, I don't know another word for it, to learn the ability to not react. Can you imagine you're taking your baby, your eight-day-old child, in to the temple to get a blessing. And a stranger walks up to you and says, you will have nothing but sorrow and misery because of this child. 
it'll be like a dagger piercing your heart. I think so many of the listeners should think about in our own personal life. If you were to carry your eight day child out in public and some stranger killed him and said that, there are several expletives that probably would have left your mouth in response to that stranger. Just that instant reaction. It's natural. It happens. It's like it's, it's so hard not to react in that moment. If nothing else, just to say, what? Like, the audacity is still a reaction. And just that, as she pondered their, their words in her, like, she just put, hmm. okay. Like, if you just see, like, alrighty then. Like, it's, 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 even that story is such wonderful wisdom because when a storm is barreling down on your house, you don't throw the front door open, step out on your porch, and scream at its face in reaction to it. You shudder the house, and you ponder the storm, and you let it rage. And when it's done, you then take action. And I think we're going to need both that quiet strength of mm-hmm. Mary and that proactive, oh no, I'm going to build, I'm going to pronounce the right judgments and the truth, strength of Bridget to get through the storm that's setting our way. We're, we're going to need both. And if you don't have a devotion to either, well, that might be a good time to start. It's very easy and it costs you nothing. You don't have to buy the rosaries and the statues and the pictures, but I have a feeling you'll eventually buy at least a rosary. <laughs> Not for five. <laughs> rosaries are an addiction as well as a fair practice. <laughs> or, or build a bunch. Oh, rosaries are so much fun to make. But I think now is a good time to start preparing ourselves for everything that's coming because they are there, they are listening, and they are willing to help. And they really do work well together because... There are times where you almost feel, at least I do, in prayer. So I often do pray to them together. This kind of tug of war back and forth between now is the time for contemplation, now is the time for action. And this kind of coming to agreement of here is a contemplative action that is the best of both worlds that I can take to move forward. I think we're going to need a lot more of that. Agreed. So I hope you've enjoyed the show. I hope that you have a blessed and wonderful third quarter moon. I hope that this helps to open some of those pathways of awe that are present in the Via Positiva. If you've enjoyed it, if you already have a devotion to both or either of these great figures, I would love to know what's your favorite devotional practice? Because there's so many, and I find it interesting that even with all the years of devotion that I have under my belt, how many practices I still have not heard of because they're regional or, you know, very specific to a particular movement or to a person that it's just something that we've come to do ourselves. I'd love to know. You can let me know in the comments. If you're listening to us on Spotify or YouTube, you can leave a comment right there. If you're listening to us anywhere else, even if they say that you can leave a comment, then you can leave a comment there because engagement is magic, but they won't let us know that you did it. So we won't know that you did So head over to creationshouse.com, click on chat. You can leave a comment there and we will see it and be able to respond. While you're there, if you have any money that you can pass our way, we think about joining a membership. You can also support us on Patreon and Kofi. I am Dorset on both. And that money really does go a long way to help us keep the lights on, roof over our head, and keep food on our tables. If you don't have any money, that's perfectly right and fully understandable right now. But if you know anybody that you think would like any of the work that we do, please share it with them. That helps us out immensely as well. Alrighty, until next time. Oh, blessed Mother Mary and fully and bright Bridget, help us through all of the difficulties of our lives. Help us to find that awe, wonder, and strength to continue to do the great work, no matter the obstacles that we feel may be set before us. Because as we have learned in time, the obstacle is the way. It shows us how to get through and how to make it to the other side. Amen. Amen. Amen.